Thank you very much. Let's talk about Clostridium difficile, and uh, perhaps it's not going to be so difficile. So, Clostridium difficile infection is a gram-positive anaerobe that's the most common cause of diarrhea developing in the hospital. Antibiotics is the most common risk factor, and people who are older are at definitely at an increased risk. And we've seen a lot more C. diff since about the year 2000 because a hypervirulent strain developed. It has different names depending on the strain typing system used to characterize it, BI, NAP1, or O27, and has resulted in many more severe cases and many more deaths in the United States, um, Canada, Japan, and other countries of Europe. I want to just talk briefly about diagnosis because we don't have perfect diagnostic tests yet, even though we recognize Clostridium difficile in 1975 or 76. Many hospitals use in enzyme immunoassay tests for toxin A and B, and the reason that they use them is because they're quick. You can get an answer within a few hours. They're not very expensive, but the downside is that they are not very sensitive and specific. So many hospitals, including ours, are moving towards nucleic acid amplification tests like PCR or loop-mediated amplification tests. And these tests are actually testing for the gene for toxin A, and they're much more sensitive and specific. So the two common approaches now are to test for a common antigen called glutamate dehydrogenase, or GDH. If this is negative, the patient probably does not have C. difficile. If it's positive, you have to do some sort of a confirmatory test because this antigen is not specific for C. difficile. It's a clostridial antigen. And so this is what our hospital was doing until a few years ago. If it was negative, no further testing. If the GDH was positive, they were doing a confirmatory uh, test like a PCR. But now our hospital is only doing PCR for toxin B. And, the, uh, and they are doing the results uh, daily, and, uh, and I think the results are much more accurate. So the take-home points about diagnostic tests are that the tests are not perfect. The PCR real-time testing seems expensive, but when you look at the decrease in hospital stay because you're making a more accurate diagnosis earlier, you can actually reduce the costs overall. But most importantly, if you remember nothing else that I say during this talk, it's that if you think your patient has C. difficile and the test is negative, go ahead and treat anyway because you may be right and the test may be wrong and there's no harm in empiric therapy. So in the U.S., there are three antibiotics that are used for Clostridium difficile. Most of us use oral metronidazole, usually a dose of 500 milligrams three times a day. Actually, 10 days is probably just as good as 14 days. We've just been developing some guidelines, and uh, that's what we've come up with evidence-based. So maybe I should uh, update these slides and change to a 10-day course. Oral vancomycin is used for people who cannot tolerate metronidazole, or, um, or do not get better with oral metronidazole, and the dose of 125 or 250 milligrams four times a day is about the same. It was, until a few weeks ago, much more expensive, but has just lost patent and become generic, so the price of this should come down significantly. And then finally, oral fidaxomycin was approved a year ago. Um, I have not prescribed this drug. The company decided to market it, at a, at a cost twice that of oral vancomycin, and I find this appalling and abhorrent, so I have not yet prescribed it. I'm not saying I might never prescribe it, but I think the drug pricing was not proper, or, or not, 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 not proper, not ethical in my view. So for mild to moderate disease, start with metronidazole unless the person is intolerant or pregnant. If they're not better in five days, it's better to switch to vancomycin. But we're talking now about GI emergencies, so we want to focus on the patient with severe C. difficile infection. So these would be some of the things to look for clinically. Fever or chills, severe diarrhea, although if the patient has a toxic colon, they may have no diarrhea at all. 
Uh, elevated white blood cell count is very uh, often seen with Clostridium difficile infection because the toxin actually acts as a, uh, as a attractant for the white blood cells. When the creatinine goes up, your patient has severe disease, and albumin drops very quickly. We presume it's, the albumin is lost in the stools, but we don't know for sure. And if there's an increased lactate, you worry, oh, again, about severe disease. So those of you who have done colonoscopy perhaps have seen these. This is typical pseudomembranes with uh, these creamy yellow-white plaques. And other, so this is a sign of severe disease, so this would be pseudomembranous colitis. But if you see colon wall thickening on a flat plate of the abdomen or on a CT scan, that's an indication of severe disease. Or if the patient has new development of ascites, that can be a side effect of C. difficile as well. So in these patients, you should start with oral vancomycin at a dose of one gram a day, so that would be 500 four times a day. A correction, um, 250 milligrams four times a day. If they're not better, increase it to two grams a day. There's no evidence to support this, but I and many of my colleagues have seen patients with severe C. diff who don't get better on that lower dose, and then when we raise the dose, they get better. So what I'm giving you is my anecdotal, unevidence-supported based recommendation. If they're not better, increase the dose. Now, sometimes people have d disease that's even beyond severe disease, and the Infectious Disease Society has called this complicated Clostridium difficile infection. It's what you and I might uh, casually call uh, toxic colon or fulminant colitis, but as much as I struggled when we were writing these guidelines to come up with a better word than complicated, I couldn't, so we'll stick with complicated. So that's severe C. difficile plus distension or ileus with a toxic colon, low albumin, or shock requiring pressor therapy. So these are the sickest of the sick of your C. difficile patients. So for these patients, you should start with that higher dose of vancomycin of two grams a day, and also consider adding vancomycin enemas, which you can give uh, four times a day by a rectal Foley tube, and also add IV metronidazole, because if there's an ileus or a toxic colon, the oral medication may not get to the colon, but IV metronidazole will cross the uh, inflamed bowel, the inflamed colon, and get into the colon lumen, which is where you want the antibiotic to be to kill the organisms. I'm going to share two cases with you. The first is a man that was referred from our jail. I mentioned I work at the county hospital, and so in addition to caring for patients who have no insurance or, uh, or no means, um, we also care for patients from the jail. And this man had had Crohn's disease diagnosed when he was a teenager, and he had had some sort of a surgery. He didn't really remember what, but probably he had some colon and small bowel resected. But he had been off his medications for many years, but in the jail he developed diarrhea, and he had left-sided abdominal pain. We did a uh, CT enterography that showed that there were two areas of his small bowel that were thickened, which would be consistent with Crohn's disease. His colon was normal, and he had very mild inflammation in his distal ileum. So we treated him with mesalamine and budesonide, and he was better. Two months later, we saw him in clinic, and he had less diarrhea. His pain was much less, and we started to transition him to azathioprine, but keeping him on the budesonide. But a month after that, he was sent to the emergency room with bloody diarrhea. He had chills. He had headache. He had lost 40 pounds um, in the jail, and uh, he had a fever, a very high fever, and a very tender abdomen. And this uh, is the CT scan, and you can see very marked colon wall thickening of his whole colon, very diffuse colitis. And remember, his colon had been normal on the colonoscopy when we saw him in the clinic. And he had a stool test. Now, this case is from a few years ago, so they did the EIA test that I mentioned for toxin A only, and it was negative. So they sent him from the emergency room up to endoscopy, where I did a sigmoidoscopy, and you can see diffuse pseudomembranes. <laughs> 
Later, his stool test for the toxin B PCR came back positive. But if we had done that test and originally, I wouldn't have this nice picture to share with you. So he was treated with this severe disease with vancomycin uh, at a relatively low dose orally. He was also given lactobacillus. To be honest, the house staff gave him this. There's no good reason for it. I don't know why they did. Um, but then he wasn't getting better, so they gradually increased the vancomycin finally to a two gram a day dose, and they added vancomycin enemas. But a couple days later, he was still very distended and still had a significant pain and diarrhea. So they added IV metronidazole, we stopped the budesonide, made him NPO, added the uh, enemas, and then he finally got better. So here's a case of inflammatory bowel disease and severe Clostridium difficile infection in a patient who did not ultimately need a colectomy. So those of you caring for patients with IBD are well aware that our IBD patients appear to be more susceptible to Clostridium difficile. And it seems as though this risk is much greater with either colonic Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. The risk appears to be with colon disease much more than with small bowel disease. And when they have this combination of C. difficile and IBD, they have an increased morbidity and mortality compared to patients with either IBD alone or C. diff alone. Importantly, they might not even have had antibiotics, and the two major risk factors are having colonic disease or immunomodulator therapy. And for those of you who do endoscopy, you might not see the pseudomembranes. They might not be there. So in these patients, we probably should start with vancomycin therapy. We probably should continue the immunosuppressive therapy, but maybe not increase it until the Clostridium difficile is controlled. However, maybe we should be stopping steroids. I'm not sure about that, but I wonder, in this patient, it was one of the things that was associated with his improvement. Any patient with an IBD flare has now to be tested for C. difficile. And if there's severe colitis, and you don't know if it's their their inflammatory bowel disease or their C. difficile, consider treating for both at the same time. And we're also seeing more cases of acute uh, inflammatory bowel disease that are occurring with C. difficile, and it's possible that the C. diff now is triggering the inflammatory bowel disease that becomes more chronic. Just a, a two months ago, I saw a young woman who had had very mild inflammatory bowel disease that was on no therapy. She developed C. difficile. We got rid of the C. difficile, and she was left with pancolitis that's now requiring a TNF therapy and, um, and a 5-ASA. And I have to wonder whether that C. difficile infection triggered the extension of her colitis, which was basically asymptomatic. Also importantly, in our patients who've had a colectomy, you can get C. diff in a J pouch, and there is a case report of, from Cleveland where the patient actually died from C. difficile in their J pouch, which they, uh, which they had not um, uh, tested for and hadn't recognized that you could get such a severe illness in a pouch. The second case I'm going to tell you about is a 56-year-old man who had had a liver transplant and in whom I found an adenocarcinoma at the splenic flexure on his screening colonoscopy. Um, it was a stage B surgery, I mean, a stage B cancer, and preoperatively he had a white blood cell count of 8,100. His albumin was 3.5, his creatinine was 1.5. Those were his normal levels, and he had a left hemicolectomy. And three days later, he had some pain at the site of an incision, but he wasn't passing gas, even though he was up and walking around. And it was thought that he probably would be able to go home pretty soon. But two days later, so five days after his surgery, his abdomen became very distended. He was very uh, uncomfortable with abdominal pain. His white blood cell count rose to 18,000. And on the next day, on a flat plate of the abdomen, his colon was very dilated with a transverse colon of 13 to 14 centimeters. He had pain, he had fever, diarrhea. The white count went up to 24,000. His albumin dropped to 2.2. His creatinine went up to 2.3. And he did have toxin A in his stools. 
He was treated with vancomycin and originally with oral metronidazole, but this was later switched to IV metronidazole, but he still had diarrhea. He still had an elevated creatinine. His colon was still distended, so the surgeons took him back to surgery and took out the other half of his colon. So the indications for surgery, this is my next topic, in him were the uh, in continued diarrhea with the rising creatinine, the rising white blood cell count, the dropping albumin, the increased colon distension, and he, the lack of response to maximal medical therapy. At surgery, his colon was very dilated. They did a colectomy with an ileostomy, and he had a little bit of a rocky or difficult post-operative course, but eventually he went home with a white blood cell count back to his near normal and a creatinine back to his baseline. So this is my lead into the question of who needs surgery for severe C. difficile disease and pseudomembranous colitis. And this can be a very difficult question to answer. In Quebec, they had thousands, actually thousands of deaths, not thousands of cases, but thousands of deaths associated with Clostridium difficile over a many year period during an epidemic through many of the hospitals in Quebec. And one of the hospitals had a surgical, had a series of patients that gave, gives us some insight into the indications for surgery. So they looked at patients over this uh, period of time who were in the ICU because their C. difficile was so serious or severe, or they would have been in the ICU with their C. difficile if they weren't already there for some other reason. And they looked at 30-day mortality. Of the 161 patients, and this is a large series, we're not likely to see this kind of analysis again in the future, 38 of them had a colectomy. The indications for colectomy were the same as we might think. Persistent shock, lack of response to maximal medical therapy, megacolon or pseudomembranous colitis, and perforation. When they looked at the overall mortality, the surgical group had an overall mortality of 34%, the medically treated group had an overall mortality of 58%. So then they went back to see what were the indicators for surgery that led to the improved survival in those patients who had their colon out. So the predictors of 30-day mortality were a lactate greater than 5, a white blood cell count greater than 20, being on shock repressors, and then being 75 years or older. And those are the patients in whom you want to involve your surgeons in a consult sooner rather than later. So my suggestions for when to get a surgery consult is a patient who's requiring pressors, any evidence of sepsis, if there's evidence of multi-organ failure, especially renal or pulmonary decline, change in mental status is often listed. Uh, I think this is a nonspecific sign. If the white blood cell count is greater than 50 or the lactate is greater than 5, call the surgeon. And if your patient hasn't gotten better after five days and you've already switched to maximal medical therapy, call your surgical colleagues for their impression. Now, this is a very small series, and um, I usually wouldn't Give, a, give much thought to a case series of only 14 patients, but it's very compelling to me because they looked at what was the difference between a small number of people who either had a left hemicolectomy for C. diff because the right colon looked fine, or they had a total colectomy. And it is a retrospective series, and the patients were having surgery for toxicity or peritonitis or perforation or toxic colon. But overall, mortality was about 36%. And this is what you may see in series. Mortality with uh, surgical uh, patients who are so sick they require surgeries anywhere from 20 to 80%, depending on the surgical series. But the patients who had their entire colon out, only 11% died, versus those in whom the surgeon elected to leave that left, the right colon in, all of them died. So if the patient is having surgery, it probably makes sense to take a, their whole colon out. However, the people in Pittsburgh, where they've had a lot of C. difficile disease, have developed another option that I think that our surgeons are going to try the next time that we have such a patient. They put in a loop ileostomy, so they're preserving the colon, but then they're lavaging the diseased colon for days with a PEG solution with vancomycin. And their mortality, they, they haven't done a randomized control trial, but they looked at 
compared to their historical controls for a total colectomy versus this series, mortality was 19% versus 50% when they just took out the entire colon. And many of these patients were able to have their colon hooked back up when the surgery, when the C. difficile was controlled. So I would like to see a controlled trial of this option. So the bottom line is early surgical consultation, and obviously, in hindsight, it would be to operate before the point of no return. So in summary, very importantly, diagnostic tests are imper imperfect, and I predict that in the United States, PCR testing will be replacing EIA testing within the next few years, but nothing replaces your clinical intuition and judgment. Treatment of severe disease should rely on high dose of oral vancomycin, the addition of IV metronidazole, the addition of vancomycin enemas. And get a surgery consult if that white blood cell count, I apologize, it should be greater than 50,000 if the lactate is greater than 5 when the abdomen is distended or your patient isn't getting better on maximal medical therapy. A closer view of our uh, Mount Rainier, Alvar Kaino, and thank you so much for your attention.